or welcome back to my YouTube channel. So for today's vlog, I will explain to you the one of the New York Times bestseller release for two years and sold more than 14 million copies. The Megatrends, 10 New Directions Transforming Our Lives, that was published in 1982 by John Nisbitt. So without further ado, let's get started. Do you know John Nisbitt? What is Megatrend? Welcome to our e-class. Let's talk about the author, megatrends, and insights. Who? He is high-tech. He is global. He is an entrepreneur. He is John Nike, and he is exemplary of just about every megatrend defining bestseller. It is no accident he wrote the book. Megatrends became a bestseller. Its author is in stronger demand than ever. What? Powerful transformative forces have to change the global economy, businesses, and society. Megatrends was an effort to understand the present in order to predict the future with the principal focus on how an information society will be different from the industrial one. Becoming an information society after having been an industrial one. From technology being forced into use to technology being pulled into use where it is appealing to people. Third, from a predominantly national economy to one in the global marketplace. Fourth, from short-term to long-term perspective. From centralization to decentralization. Sixth, from getting help through institutions like government to self-help. Seventh, from representative to participative democracy. Eighth, from hierarchies to networking. Nine, from a northeastern bias, southwestern one. And lastly, from seeing things as either or to having more choice. What now? Was clearly correct in the growth of high tech industries, globalization, the information explosion enhancing democracy, the boom in social networking, and the massive increases in consumer choices. When involving marketing as it will begin to open the eyes to the possibilities and potential of current trends as innovation is becoming central to both the organization it's critical to adopt the visionary mindset what are the fundamental forces that will change our world identify these trends and understanding their impact is key to knowing how businesses and communities operate today and soon the future these are the mega trends a term point by john nike in the 1980s they are large transformative processes with global range, broad scope, and dramatic impact. We began as a nation of farmers. We devoted our land, energy, and resources to agriculture. But soon, the nation would gear up for the industrial age and would manage a partnership with machines. Certain entrepreneurs saw opportunity in this new age and seized the challenge. They were the Fords, the Duplets, and the Rockefellers. America became a nation of laborers. Then in 1957, Sputnik shattered the global communications barrier and America witnessed the dawn of new age. Television sets appeared virtually in every household and white-collar worker began to outnumber the blue collar. The information age was taking form around us.
trans is a wake-up call to this new age and the changes that such an era will bring today, megatrans author John Knightbit will explore the 10 new directions shaping our lives. You'll recognize the impact of the new technology we've created and how we're structuring our lives along these new directions. When we've finished, you'll realize new opportunities and have a better understanding of where to target your energies. The most reliable way to anticipate the future is by understanding the present. John Knight did try to do in Megatrends. He wrote Megatrends to provide a framework for the information age and for all the changes such an era is making in our lives. The acceleration, distribution, and application of computing power coupled with exponential growth are enabling the extraordinary technological advances we have entered the fourth industrial revolution. The age of change is astonishing. Impactful technologies can range from artificial intelligence to quantum computing, from drones and autonomous vehicles to virtual and augmented reality. 3D printing, robotics, and connecting. 90% of the world's data has been created in the past two years. In the last five years, the number of people using the internet grew by 83%. Almost 60% of the world's population is now connected, and almost half of us use social media. Right now, there are over 22 billion connected devices around the world. In 2030, there will be 50 billion to see a massive web of interconnected devices from consumer product to infrastructures such as street lights and garbage bins. Our adoption to these connected devices has only just begun. Machines are getting faster and better. AlphaGo Zero and AI programs has off the game by playing against itself. The use of algorithm is accelerating an exponential rate of 90% of stock trade. Now created the Buy Algorithm. Up to 75% since 2017. Robots are getting better at building things. Algorithm can diagnose disease. Write articles can manage fonts and deliver individual... Exponentially more data is being produced through billions of phones, digital platforms and countless sensors. However, there is a deepening inequality with the spread of technology across the world and also between citizens and corporations. Impactful technology also poses significant challenges from cybersecurity and privacy to rising inequality and job automation. Questions about bias in technologies driven by algorithms and artificial intelligence and how to make them accountable will only increase in urgency and importance. The pace of change is an invitation to understand the profound shifts that are underway and to ensure that this technology empowers individuals, businesses and communities. The necessary response to impactful tech is to refine our understanding of what it means to be human. The world economy is set to shift as Asia becomes the largest training region, fueling the rise of a mass affluent community and a new brain of corporations. Just two countries, China and India, would count to 35% of the world's population and 25% of global GDP. This megatrend looks at the global economic power shift. We will see a restructuring of the global economy with non-OECD economies expected to account for 57% of GDP by 2030. The economic influence of the G7 countries will shift to the emerging seven countries. By 2040, the E7 economies will be double that of the G7. India and China will take up a rising share of the world output as the world's economic center of gravity shifts towards Asia. However, the individual purchasing power of citizens in the West will remain higher than consumers in both India and China. China will need to secure even more of the world's natural resources and grow markets for its expanding economy. Under the Belt and Road Initiative, China will invest in economic development and transportation in more than 130 countries. By 2030, 5 billion people will be middle class. This global mass affluent community possess significant purchasing power. Two thirds of them will reside in Asia Pacific. The shift in wealth to the rich will accelerate. 
Currently, about half of the world's wealth is held by 1% of the population. By 2030, the richest 1% will own two-thirds. Globalization itself has produced unequal returns. Rising inequality is challenging trust in global economic institutions and agreements. More frequent trade wars and rising protectionism will drive uncertainty and instability. How will individuals, corporations and governments renegotiate their expectations of one another in an era of amplified individuals and rapidly changing economies? The rise of powerful technology, companies, big tech, has come to access the fast use of data in the global range. Various digital platforms are now keen to other infrastructure essential for our society, giving them the power over our economy and our society. The degree to which lawmakers will make fundamental changes to the way these companies are regulated and taxed will determine the true balance of power. Economic power shifts of this magnitude will fundamentally change both individual and nation's prosperity. These opportunities, along with significant risks, will play out on the world stage. The climate and resource security megatrend captures the increasing pressure on critical resources within the mega-ecological narrative of climate change. By mid-century, demand for food and water will place these resources under stress. We will need to produce 60 to 100 percent more food, and 5 billion people could be facing a critical lack of water. The world's fish stock is being pushed towards collapse. At the current rate, 88 percent of the stock will be overfished by 2050. This unprecedented demand on the Earth's resources is unfolding against the bigger story of global climate change. We are witnessing unstoppable bushfires and smoke-filled cities. Glaciers and islands are disappearing. Tropical archipelagos are increasingly lashed by intense monsoon storms. Climate change is not a prediction. It is our new normal. Prolonged droughts, rising sea levels and more frequent severe weather events threaten to make more areas unlivable, displacing many millions of people from their home. Climate disruption is also accelerating global biodiversity crisis, threatening one million species to the brink of extinction. This megatrend contains in it the environmentalist's paradox. The more we deplete our resources and degrade our ecosystems, the more average human well-being improves globally. But how long can we sustain rising consumption in the face of ecosystem degradation that is also increasingly global? By 2050, demand for energy will increase by 30% above current global use. Technological and market innovations are racing to unlock the promise of renewable energy. With innovations like battery storage, solar and wind technologies, we are creating the potential to rethink energy production and revolutionize how consumers access energy. More than 60 rare metals are critical for renewable technologies, for batteries, electric and hybrid cars, smartphones and tablets. However, increasing demand and the rare nature of such materials could severely limit the continued production of new technologies. Corporations are principal agents in the production of greenhouse gas and can no longer ignore the trade-off between economic and environmental well-being. It is no longer possible to continue with business as usual. But as capitalism depends on consuming the natural environment to ensure continual economic growth, how can business and governments respond to the challenge of our time? Communities around the world are experiencing rapid and profound demographic change, creating new challenges for businesses and individuals alike. After more than 200 years of rapid growth, the world's population is set to peak at 11 billion by the end of the century. People are living longer and are having fewer children. As populations age, there will be fewer workers to support the growing number of people in retirement. For every elderly person, Today, there are four people of working age. By 2050, that ratio is projected to be just two people of working age to every four elderly persons. 
For places like Europe, this will mean a need to increase participation in the labor force from women and the elderly themselves, plus possibly an increased reliance on immigration to sustain the workforce. Human demographic change is occurring at a different pace across the globe. By 2050, Africa will be the major contributor to global population growth. Africa's share of global population will rise from 16% in 2015 to 25% in 2050. As the developed world ages, Africa's younger population will require very different approaches and policies. If managed well, a youthful population carries an energy that can be harnessed for dynamic economic growth. Demographic and social changes will see governments and businesses finding huge opportunities, as well as facing huge challenges as the largest generation in history, millennials, drive the economy. Millennials and those that come after them will be more educated and come with different expectations regarding opportunity, mobility, relationships and ownership. If we want to thrive, not just survive, in the 21st century, we must address global needs for more women joining the workforce, lifelong learning and adequate health care. The future is one of cities. Today, more than half the world's population live in cities, generating 85% of global GDP. Globally, we are on track for 60% urbanization by 2030. In the developed world, consolidation will be even more intense with an estimated 81% of the population living in cities. The majority of this will happen in Africa and Asia. Whilst urbanization creates huge opportunities for smart eco-cities, there are also significant challenges that come with different types of urbanization, including tremendous demands on infrastructure and the environment, provision of services and job creation. Cities consume three quarters of the world's natural resources. New York, Beijing, Shanghai and London will need $8 trillion in infrastructure investments alone over the next decade. By 2030, solid waste management will dominate municipal budgets in low- and middle-income countries. This megatrend has built-in tension due to demographic change. Many cities are set to grow with 1.5 million people a week joining cities across the world through a combination of migration and childbirth. However, around 100 of the top cities are expected to shrink over the next 10 years in part due to aging populations in countries like Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea and China. New centers of growth are emerging in Asia and in Africa. So, how do we plan, build and lead better cities? Healthy cities are about everything we do in our urban lives, our work and our communities, our natural and built environment, the social, digital and financial layers around them. Cities are undergoing profound changes from new practices in construction and utilities to transport and logistics, from how we do healthcare to how we share our cities. They are as much about smart technologies and financial flows as they are about the art that flourishes and outlasts laws. The focus of future cities is ultimately on increasing opportunity and improving the quality of life for the people living in them. We are witnessing the rise of the individual like never before. Tremendous technological advances and connectivity are empowering individuals across the world. Almost 5 billion people are using mobile phones, and of those devices, more than half are smartphones. Social platforms have fundamentally changed the way people communicate, interact and organize their lives. From sharing information and organizing knowledge on Wikipedia, WeChat and Twitter, to funding new ventures on Kickstarter or peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces on Airbnb, Uber or Airtasker. Use of mobile payment is 11 times higher in China than in the United States. Chinese tech firms Alibaba, Tencent and Baidu rival Facebook, Google and Amazon in innovation, the size of their customers, profitability and social impact. 
there is an increasing expectation for experience and personalization rather than consumption. Access to information changes not only the way we consume, but also the way we interact with companies and the influence we have over the products and their services. This megatrend will vary substantially across different regions. Those who do not have access to technology and connectivity available to most will feel increasingly disempowered. New forms of organization, such as the gig economy, also raise new questions around responsibilities of businesses and the status and rights of workers. This megatrend is accelerating as more individuals are connected to internet services and as large social platforms invent new ways to draw people into their ecosystems. While giving people a voice, the same data practices and business models also amplify misinformation and disinformation, harmful and extremist content. Rising rates of depression, stress and anxiety amongst adolescents are linked to increased use of social media and the introduction of smartphones. Technology, however, could also be an opportunity for improved individualized delivery for mental health services. As this trend continues to amplify our voices, governments and individuals need to understand the trade-offs between access and privacy, between empowerment and isolation. More and more as the years go by, the relatively independent life of the frontiersman, the homesteader and the freight tradesman is disappearing from the American scene. As communities grow larger and more complex, as men become more interdependent, their pattern of living becomes more highly organized. The local community of today is swallowed up in a process of centralization. Its activities and institutions are more and more controlled by powerful organizations acting on a nationwide scale. Organizations whose decisions are so vital to the welfare of the community that its citizens often feel their power to govern their own affairs is gone. Today, many thinking citizens are concerned about the growing centralization of decisions, controlling the business, the social life, and the public affairs of every community. This was not always so. A century and more ago, the local community was far more independent than it is today. Its citizens were men who believed they were free, free to work as they chose in association with their neighbors, free to seek the good things of life in the manner of their own choosing free to make their own decisions in most matters affecting them. Citizens making their own decisions. This was a decentralized pattern of life. But life was changing even then. A revolution in transportation, in communication, a vast transformation in methods of production. All this was drawing men and their communities closer together, tightening their bonds of interdependence, making their lives more complex, compelling them to organize their activities on an ever-widening scale. As local communities faced an increasing number of problems they were unable to overcome alone, there came the need for greater centralization. Many of these problems soon grew too big for even the states to handle. To deal with these problems, it became necessary for the federal government to exercise responsibility on a national scale. In recent years, an increasing number of functions have grown to national size. American citizens today are consumers of national brands made and distributed by nationwide enterprises. Many hold jobs as members of national labor unions. They get their news from nationwide news services and periodicals with national circulation. Their entertainment comes to them over nationwide broadcasting networks. They belong to nationally organized clubs and they worship in nationally organized churches. Likewise, their public needs are increasingly served by the states and the national government. From social security to highways built with state and federal funds, from food and drug inspection to the regulation of airplane travel, from the regulation of wages and hours to the development of atomic energy, citizens look to the state and the federal government for the performance of a crowding succession of services too great for any community to handle alone. Most especially, we expect the citizens of local communities to shoulder the responsibility for all activities affecting them alone. For example, all the activities and services carried on exclusively within a single community for the special benefit of its people are clearly the responsibility of the community and its citizens. For example, 
It's clearly a state job to regulate public services operating exclusively within the state. On the other hand, it's clearly the job of the federal government to regulate a thing as wholly national in scope as radio broadcasting. However, state and national governments work together on such problems as social security. While such a problem as a devastating flood over a wide area may call for the cooperation of local as well as state and national authorities. The first thing is to give local groups a method of expressing their views effectively before central authorities make decisions. Once a policy has been adopted with consideration to local groups, the next step is to give citizens and their local community organizations a share in the work to be done. Even when the control of a project has to be centralized, much of the administrative responsibility can be shouldered by local groups, giving everyone a chance to participate in the common enterprise. In a democratic nation, citizens must recognize the need for a proper balance between local and centralized authority. Essential to the democratic process is a balanced working relationship in the making of decisions on all levels of government, with each level serving the nation as best it can, making its own unique contribution to a strong and growing democracy. Our next megatrend is the shift from north to south. The beginning of a new decade is an ideal time to write a book about trends. Once every 10 years, the U.S. Census Bureau brings into sharp focus the complex panorama of American life. And for a short while, we know a lot about ourselves. Authors who previously relied to an expert guesstimate and anecdotal material have access to rings and hard statistical data. It doesn't last, however. By mid-decade, the picture is blurred again. Plundering as before, we are ignorant of what's really happening in this multi-layered continent of a country where for every trend there is often an equality compelling counter trend. But for a short time, a year or maybe two, time and statistics seems to stand still and the Census Bureau offers us a dazzling inventory of an American people and their business and economic activity. The North South shift is irreversible in our lifetime. The shift in population and economic strength from North to South is only the beginning. The restructuring of America from North to South is gaining increased momentum. Now as we begin to experience the consequences of the initial mass migration of jobs, people and economic activity. An examination of some of these indicators makes the case. For example, living standard. Metropolitan residents of the Northeast have the lowest standard of living in the country according to the conference board. The income, the housing, the ripple effect is quite pronounced here. Housing start in the Northeast were a robust 22% of the nation's total in 1966. Consider some new cities of great opportunities like Albuquerque, Austin, Denver, Phoenix, Salt Lake City, San Antonio, San Diego, and San Jose. Skilled in the mobile, and especially the young, these cities represent the promise of continued growth and prosperity. But what are the prospects if you are unemployed in the North? What it boils down to the need of change or adapt. Moving to the Southwest is an option that many have taken. But if you don't have to move, you must adapt. That means acquiring skills in the sunrise industry, operating in your area. Life choices are no longer either or. Manhattan will continue to be an important information switching station for the world, while the four boroughs around it continues in rich decline. Lowell, Massachusetts, the birthplace of industrial revolution in America, has lost its industrial base, but it is today the world headquarters of Wang Laboratories, one of the great leaders in the new information system. But either or or to multiple option. Personal choices for Americans remain rather narrow and limited from the post-war period to much of the 1960s. Many of us lived the simple lives portrayed in such television series. There were a few decisions to make 
it was an either or world. Either we got married or we did not. And of course, we almost always did. Either we worked 9 to 5 or other regular full-time hours or we didn't work, period. Chocolate or vanilla. In conclusion, we are living in the time of parenthesis, the time between eras. It is as though we have bracketed off the present from both the past and the future. For we are neither here nor there. We have not quite left behind the either or or America of the past centralized, industrialized, and economically self-contained. With one foot in the old world, where we live mostly in the Northeast, relied on institutional help, built hierarchies, and elected representatives. We have approached problems with an eye toward the high techs, short-term solutions, but we have not embraced the future either. We have done the human thing. We are clinging to the known past in the fear of the unknown future. This book outlines one interpretation of the future in order to make it more real, more knowable. Those who are willing to handle the ambiguity of this in-between period and to anticipate the new era will be quantum leap ahead of those who hold on the past. The time of the parenthesis is the time of change and questioning. As we move from an industrial to an informational society, we will use our brain power to create instead of our physical power and the technological of the day will extend and enhance our mental ability. As we take advantage and the opportunity of the job and growth, investment, in all of the sunrise industry, we must not lose sight of the need to such is the time of the parenthesis, its challenges, its possibilities, and its questioning. Although the time between the eras is uncertain, it is a great and easy time filled with opportunity. If we can learn to make uncertainty our friend, we can achieve much more than stable eras. In stable eras, everything has a name and everything knows its place and we can leverage very little. But in the time of the parenthesis, we have extraordinary leverage and influence, individually, professionally, and institutionally. If we can only get a clear sense, a clear conception, a clear vision of the road ahead, my God, what a fantastic time to be alive.